a good morning or afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jan Breaker, Chief Operating Officer of the Antibody Society. Today's webinar is one in a series designed to inform and educate our members, as well as the broader scientific community, about topics relating to antibody discovery and development. Our expert speaker, Dr. Ed Horton, will discuss the results of a study that compared bispecific antibody formats with the aim of assessing their feasibility. Please note this webinar is being recorded. Please do add any and all questions to the Q&A box in the viewer and those questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Without further ado, I'll now turn the show over to our speaker. Hello everyone, it's great to be here. I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about our organization, uh, Absolute Biotech and some work that we've been doing at Absolute Antibody uh, on uh, some feasibility studies of potential bispecific formats. In this case, we use trastuzumab and humanized OKT3 to look at really trying to understand um, the, the feasibility of making these materials in a reproducible fashion that we could then uh, set expectations for our customers looking for different bispecific formats mm -hmm. and how those would work um, in our system. So I, I'd like to first preempt this a little bit. Uh, all this work was done by our Absolute Antibody counterparts, our, our CSO of Absolute Antibody, my, Dr. Mike Feebig, uh, who designed uh, most of these antibodies, uh, and our COO, uh, Dr. Catherine Bladen, who works at our, uh, our facility in the UK. Uh, I am uh, cautiously representing them uh, in this presentation, but uh, they are the true experts in the formatting and the production of these materials. Uh, and I'll do my best to, uh, to, to share with you their results uh, and, uh, and you know, fundamentally what, they, uh, what we found with these bispecific formats. Okay. So briefly, Absolute Biotech is a new organization. Uh, the organization was founded um, in September of last year. And what it actually does is bring together six different organizations that are really devoted to the curation of antibodies. And what does that mean? The curation of antibodies for us is actually taking all of the material that's out there in the research space, uh, in the, the diagnostic space and fundamentally curating that material for forever. Uh, the idea is to make sure that we can reproduce that material and, and, and uh, make it available without uh, use of, of animals, without the use of, of, of you know, sort of uh, classic uh, antibody production and, and be able to keep that material in its DNA uh, sequence and use that material and, and, and manufacture it in a reproducible fashion. What we like to say is that we want to be able to know to the atom uh, every antibody that's available so that uh, there is no risk in losing that antibody or uh, you know, not being able to reproduce that antibody for future generations. So that's our core mission at Absolute Biotech. The different brands you see here are uh, devoted to different components of that uh, of strategic vision. Uh, Absolute Antibody, which is the focus today, is, is the experts in antibody engineering and recombinant antibody technology uh, in cell-based cell uh, production of our antibodies. Uh, Carafast is a, is a really, uh, you know, a, a, almost a philanthropic organization that, that takes uh, research-grade antibodies, research-grade materials, cell lines, and uh, in academic settings and puts those into uh, a, a way that they can be marketed and sold uh, as research tools. Uh, Nordic MuBio is a really interesting organization. It's, it's founded on flow cytometry reagents, uh, some really best in class flow cytometry agents at Nordic MuBio. Uh, LSBio is a company based in Seattle that is uh, really foundational for IHC validated antibodies. They have over a million antibodies in their collection uh, and uh, many that are uh, some of the highest quality for IHC, uh, so immunohistochemistry. Exalpha, again, reagents and kits for uh, antibody research, and Everest, which is still making goat polyclonals. Uh, we're actually in the process of migrating those goat polyclonals, as I said earlier, and curating those goat polyclonals into uh, uh, doing their sequences, and then taking those sequences and producing those recombinantly, so we no longer actually use uh, the, the 
an animal, create an animal free system. So uh, we are migrating uh, our Everest uh, polyclonal antibodies into uh, recombinant technology. So uh, we're, we're trying to be good stewards of our own, uh, of our own mission statement uh, to uh, take those antibodies and uh, migrate those into uh, our recombinant platforms. So Absolute Biotech, again, collection of, of, of organizations uh, we all represent sort of the same vision and, and mission, which is to be antibody curators, um, but in, in, in you know in various uh, stages of that uh, of that journey. So again, uh, we offer a, a, a massive catalog of antibodies. Uh, you may not uh, be aware of our our entire organization, uh, but you've probably heard of uh, all the antibodies that we uh, we offer. Um, uh, again, we have ELISA kits, IHC antibodies, as I said, with LS Bio. We focus on functionally most of the deep key research areas in cancer immunotherapy, allergy, neuroscience. Uh, I encourage you to uh, get in touch with us if there's a if there's a, uh, a research area that uh, that you're interested in. Um, I often say that um, we're probably one of the only organizations in the in the world that can either provide an antibody or actually make an antibody uh, for your research needs. So. Um, uh, my, my colleagues don't like when I say it, but I often say if you can dream it and the biology allows it, uh, we can make it. Uh, and I think that's a really uh, powerful uh, uh, vision that we have. Uh, and again, recombinantly animal free. Uh, again, a, a recombinant engineered antibodies, uh, I'll go through today talking to you about the engineered antibodies uh, that we did, these bispecifics that are really becoming uh, the functional, uh, you know, most common candidate for uh, for drugs that are being used uh, now. So specifically, as I said, absolute antibody is our uh, recombinant engineered uh, recombinant technology uh, you know center. It's based in the northeast of England. Uh, I highly recommend if you can get there. It's a beautiful place. Uh, recommend in the summer or late summer. It's a beautiful area near the uh, near the coast. Uh, winter is not so friendly, but uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful area to go visit. Um, again, the company vision for Absolute Antibody, the division of Absolute Biotech is to make recombinant engineered antibodies accessible to a very large community. Uh, we uh, service the globe. Uh, we're happy to take, uh, you know, uh, and, and work with you and create materials uh, across uh, all research areas. Uh, it's been around for almost, uh, well, more than a decade. Um, and now is uh, functionally uh, part of Absolute Biotech. <clears throat> Again, we have high throughput. Uh, some of the services we offer is hybridoma sequencing, recombinant expression and purification, antibody engineering, which I'll talk about most of today, and humanization. Uh, again, there's very little that the engineering team in the in the uh, UK can't do. Uh, and again, I I often say the only limitation is the biology. Uh, if nature doesn't want it to happen, it's it's really hard to make it happen. But uh, I think the team there, uh, if it can if it can be done, uh, will actually uh, do a great job of it. And it is true. If you just uh, let me know, contact me. Uh, we, we'll happy to host you and and visit the laboratory. Uh, we we often do uh, uh, host uh, our clients uh, at the at the facility. Uh, it's uh, like I said, it's a great place to visit uh, in the northeast of the UK. So again, absolute antibody expertise. Um, it's it's really wide ranging. Uh, we have a significant number of catalog antibodies. I, I think we're up to 20, well, 20 almost twenty five thousand recombinant antibodies um, that we can use. Uh, we can sell off the shelf, uh, so you can order those right away. Um, if you don't see something you uh, that that you know suits your research needs, of course we have a, a team that can help you uh, create one. Uh, we we serve all markets. Again, we've been diagnostic re research. We uh, we really uh, do try to create uh, the antibody that fits your needs. Uh, the catalog antibodies are available off the shelf, as I said, uh, different isotypes, different species, different formats. Uh, again, if we don't see something uh, that fits your research needs, we can, of course, make it. Um, and to date, uh, and I'll show you this in a, in a, in a bit, uh, we've made now over 200 different formats. Uh, so you can see the different uh, different types on the top right, uh, subtype switching, species switching, isotype switching, and reformatting. Um, it really does it, it does become a collaborative effort uh, to make sure that uh, we we help you meet your research needs. 
uh, and that uh, is dependent on the conversation. So having a conversation with our team to make sure we uh, address what you're actually looking for. So today's topic is buy specifics. Uh, the buy specific market uh, is is really uh, ramping up. Uh, just a month ago, we had a new uh, a new clearance uh, for a buy specific. Uh, so there's five uh, uh, approvals in the last uh, two years. Um, there's more than 20 platforms. You can see all the different uh, acronyms on the bottom left there of what different uh, antibodies and buy specifics. These are specific to the that format are actually in clinic or in trials and how many are actually been uh, uh, approved. So you can see that the pipeline is, is quite large for bi-specific formats. And you can see the different formats on the right hand side. And I'll go through some of the, so you, you can see the IgG SCFDs, uh, the not and whole, cross NAVs, uh, heterogeneous NAVs, uh, dual bodies, tandem SC darts. I mean, all the different formats it functionally um, there's a, a different format for all the different disease states that are being treated. I think it's important uh, to know that, you know, what we were trying to do here is assess based on what the clinical trials are doing, what the manufacturability of these molecules is. So every single different format will have a different um, production or, or uh, you know, transcription uh, concerns. And we want to be able to set expectations. If you ask for a knob and hole by specific, you know, what is the typical, uh, uh, you know, yield of that molecule so that we can set expectations so that you don't expect, you know, hundred mg per liter. And, you know, we know based on this work that the odds for a knob and hole by specific are, you know, tens of milligrams per liter. Uh, and that's very important when you're talking about, you know, doing the research or, or wanting to manufacture these in large scale that we know how uh, these uh, are, are produced. Uh, one of the things that we have worked on uh, quite, uh, you know, in, in the near term is optimizing these uh, transcriptions so that we can get as much uh, uh, material out of each transcription as possible, as transfection as possible. And I think it's important uh, that this work that you're seeing is not the optimized. What we did was used our normal expression system and, uh, and just showed the results. Uh, if we, uh, we are actually working now for codon optimization to actually improve those, uh, those, uh, the, that, 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 uh, that expression and uh, across all of these different formats. So what we did, we took 17 formats uh, and, and produced those, and I'll go through the data of all those here in a second. Uh, so again, this is something that some of you may have seen. It's our periodic table of antibodies. It's really a great format. Uh, the you know this, the the scientific team and marketing uh, group did a great job putting this together. Um, we're actually over 200 formats. I believe the table here shows 100 and I think it's 180 formats, uh, but we're over 200 different formats. You can see IgEs, IgMs, uh, all kinds of different uh, IgGs, bispecifics, uh, nanobodies. Uh, just a great uh, wealth of, of formats that we can make. And it's important that we've made all these materials. These are not just what's available or what we can make or what we think we can make. These are all products that we've actually made and produced uh, for different customers and clients uh, throughout uh, the last decade. All right, so this is this uh, this is a study. So what we did was we took uh, HER2 CD3 bispecific. So we took uh, Herceptin, Trastuzumab, and the OKT3 uh, SCFE regions and combine those in 17 different formats. Uh, and those 17 formats align with the clinical trials of those molecules. Uh, the most common one being just a bispecific or a bite uh, molecule, uh, but uh, you can see all the different formats there. We label them bispecific AV1 through 17, uh, and they fall into, you know, functionally six different groups, 2-2, 2 2 uh, fragments, 2-1 fragments, and 1-1 one, one fragments. Uh, again, these align exactly with what's in the clinical trials. We didn't just make these up. Uh, we wanted to make sure that they align with what people are using and doing every day. Uh, the other thing that you'll see is these FC null. That's our proprietary absolute antibody uh, silencing technology. Um, in the, uh, the uh, RMD controls, we just use the LALA mutation. Uh, but it's important to know that FC null is our own silenced uh, technology. So point mutations that uh, render the FC null uh, or, or inactive. 
Okay. Oh, and by the um, at the end here, uh, we're working with Sanquin to actually do uh, uh, in vitro assays, cell-based assays, to look at the activity of all 17 of these molecules. That data is still pending, uh, but as you can imagine, with 17 different uh, antibodies, uh, it takes some time, and we hope to be able to present that data in the near future. But uh, I'll show you some preliminary data at the very end of the talk. So uh, on to the expression. Uh, it's very, in, uh, you know, it's 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 it seems pretty obvious, but the uh, the native parental monoclonals express very high, uh, over 100 mg per liter or close to 100 mg per liter in, in both cases. Uh, we did this on a pilot scale, so only 80 mils. Uh, so you can see the yield at the end was only five and seven, but we just used these as controls. We weren't trying to make a lot of material. And then the, uh, the other control was the N-terminal. OKT3 and the C-terminal FC OKT3, uh, those two molecules on their bottom left. So just to uh, make sure everyone's aware of the sort of the yellow uh, SCFVs is the HER2 uh, and the, uh, I guess that's purple is OKT3. That's the uh, SCFV for OKT3. So you'll see that throughout the, the presentation that we, uh, that, that uh, and, and the blue is the, uh, the FC uh, region. So uh, parental monoclonals uh, have parental uh, comparable expression. Uh, the IgG1s uh, in the controls, we just used the LALA mutation. We didn't use our, uh, our null FC silent mutation. Uh, it's just a little bit different, uh, but we did do that to reduce FCR binding. Uh, we did uh, use um, the CD3 as the SCFE in, in, on both uh, the biospecifics uh, to, uh, to use those as antigen targets. And uh, we did humanize the OKT3 to create stable SCFE. Uh, you'll see in our ELISA data that we used uh, our CD3 antigen for all of our ELISA data to, to confirm binding. Uh, and then, of course, the cell-based assays is coming through our collaboration with Sanquin. So our first uh, set of data is bivalent FC null. Again, FC null is our, our proprietary FC silent uh, technology. Uh, bivalent, bispecific, bispecific designs. These are the most common ones. Uh, these are the ones that are, are most commonly used and are, are functionally the ones that are approved in, in, uh, for, for, uh, for, uh, for clinical use. Uh, bivalent bispecifics with different OKT3 SCFB placements really have a dramatic effect on expression and aggregate levels. So you can see here that when we went to the uh, NC, SEFE, knob and hole, uh, uh, heavy chain, we see 14 mg per liter. And with just the N terminals, SCFE heavy chain, we see up to 200 mg per liter. So the, you know, we're talking about a 10, well, a, a, yeah, a tenfold almost, uh, 15 fold uh, reduction in yield based on where the, uh, uh, the, uh, the SCFE is attached. Uh, so it, there is a dramatic effect on yield based on uh, the different formats being used in these two by two bivalents. Of course, uh, the BAB1, as I, as I mentioned, the top left there is the most common format uh, used. It is one of the higher yield formats. Uh, and so it's a good candidate if you're, you, you need a, 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 a bispecific. Um, so, and then you see on the EC50, uh, the nanomolar, so those are the, uh, the ELISA data. They all bind relatively strongly to uh, the CD3 antigen. Uh, and of course, again, we're doing uh, function, functional studies uh, as we move uh, uh, through with all these different molecules. All right. So the 2-1 FC uh, null bispecific designs, again, we take one SCFE uh, and attach it to the different uh, uh, FC regions. Um, and you can see that uh, the yields are are relatively good. Um, I think they're in the average range, 79 to 27. Uh, again, it has a drastic effect when you uh, move the uh, the SCFE either on the N terminal or the C terminal of of the FE um, of the of the, uh, of the FC. Sorry. Uh, so I think it's it's really important to know that um, as you move the SCFE around the framework, uh, it will have a drastic effect on the different yields. Again, we see good uh, binding of all these molecules to the CD3 antigen. Uh, and um, I think it's, it's important, uh, depending on what your, you know, research goals are, uh, and how much material you'll need uh, to determine what, uh, what molecule you'll, you're interested in producing. 
I think what's clear in most of this data is that it's, it's ideal to actually make uh, several different formats for your research goals uh, and, and get the material uh, that you want to test, uh, test that material for your assay, and then we can optimize uh, yield uh, depending on the material that works best in your assay. The 1-1 one, one FC null bispecifics, um, you can see uh, again, the, uh, the XMAB, the CrossMAB had the lowest um, uh, uh, yield. Uh, it's actually very difficult to make that material. Uh, so that one is, is one that you know, we would wanna definitely engineer and see if we can improve the yield. The heterodynamic uh, dimeric bispecifics were, were, were really well, they're produced well, uh, but the yields are actually quite low for the CrossMAB uh, material. And you can see that at BAB 11, that there's a significant uh, number of homodimers there that, uh, that, you, that, that impact the yield of the final uh, monomer. Uh, but we can produce stable interfaces. Uh, we do create high, high quality monovalent biostatics and high yield. Uh, you can see BAB12 uh, was actually produced at 120 mg per liter. BAB12 is actually uh, one of our biospecifics that's in the catalog. You can actually purchase that today if you'd like. Uh, that, uh, that material is our our uh, CD3 bispecific uh, that's uh, that's in that catalog, uh, uh, and it has you know good binding, and it's very pure. You can see that on the top right, the SEC uh, trace. All right, let's do the last ones. These are uh, FAB SCFVs. Um, you can see we uh, don't have uh, the FC region in these bispecifics. These are functionally fragments uh, of of antibodies. Uh, you can see the yield in general for all of these material is is relatively low, uh, anywhere from 18 to 60 mg per liter, uh, and their formats um, uh, are 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 you know are are a little bit more tricky to make, um, but they do uh, produce good binding um, and uh, and uh, and and good yields for for the most part. We can get you enough material to uh, to test. So non-FC bispecifics using the SEFE or tandem SEFE designs, uh, we made them successfully. A novel dimerization domain was used to create the FEB2 design. So we did uh, do some engineering on the uh, dimerization domains uh, to get these uh, formatted. Uh, interestingly, the SCFE attached to the C terminal of the FAB heavy chain produced higher, higher yield than the C terminal of the light chain. Uh, so it, it does matter where you put these, uh, whether it's on the, F, uh, the heavy chain on the C terminal. Uh, of, of the light chain or the heavy chain. So it, it's, it's really about uh, taking these molecules and understanding that the biology kind of determines the yield. Uh, we do our best uh, with our, our expression system to uh, improve that yield. Uh, but when we get yields that are relatively low, we can actually do uh, quite a bit of engineering uh, to improve that yield. Again, it just depends on what your research goals are. Uh, and uh, you know, functionally talking to us and working with us on uh, the molecule that you need uh, for your research. All right. Okay. And I know uh, I know this was scheduled for an hour, but I'm happy to take questions at the end. But the, the, in the end, uh, you know, we produced over 200 different engineered antibody formats. Uh, those are all the formats uh, that are in that periodic table. Um, uh, including, of course, the bispecifics that I mentioned today. We did uh, 17 in this case. Uh, we used the clinical, uh, you know, trials uh, to model those 17, uh, and using, of course, two of the most common monoclonal uh, therapeutics out there: trastuzumab and uh, and the OKT3 uh, antibody. Uh, we found that SC-containing formats and the placement, especially the placement of the SCFE, can influence the expression dramatically. Uh, you saw ranges from four mg per liter all the way up to almost 200 mg per liter. Uh, so you can imagine that when you set up an expression with us, uh, depending on where the SCFE might be placed, uh, we're going to get a very different uh, result. Uh, I think we let the biology and the science dictate you know, what we do next. Uh, but I, I think through collaboration, we really work hard to make sure that we give you the best material possible. Uh, and functionally, if I, I truly believe this, the laboratory, if it can be made, we can make it, um, and uh, if the biology allows it. Uh, the knob and hole mutations in FC have been used widely for heterodynamic FC designs. Uh, we use the knob and holes, a common knob and hole design 
Uh, these interfaces allow for heavy chain and light chains. They're absolutely critical for success to make sure you get the right molecule, uh, the bispecific molecule you're actually looking for. Uh, so the knob and hole mutations work uh, very well to do that. Again, the functional characterizations are ongoing. Uh, you can see some very preliminary data on the right there uh, uh, using, um, I believe that's flow cytometry to look at cells uh, and uh, the impact of these, uh, these bispecifics on this on CD3 uh, activity. Um, just to restate, Absolute Biotech is the large organization. Absolute Antibody is our laboratory that makes these custom engineered antibodies. It's really, uh, uh, you know, the, the facility is fantastic. The team is fantastic. I can't say enough about uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Bladen and Dr. Feebig. Uh, they are just in incredibly passionate about this technology and the use of the, uh, the uh, recombinant technology to help uh, really curate antibodies uh, across time. As our, the founder uh, uh, once said, uh, we want to keep these antibodies in perpetuity. Uh, so forever having these antibody and antibody sequences. And we have rescued sequences. It's a really good story. We've had some very important antibodies in the world uh, for research and for clinical use uh, that uh, were uh, functionally gonna be lost to time. And we were able to sequence those, uh, produce those, and, and uh, show that they work uh, in that setting. So I highly encourage everyone that if you have a precious antibody that you uh, are concerned about producing in the future, you don't have its DNA sequence, uh, that you get that product sequenced. Uh, we can do it from the protein de novo. We can, uh, we can do it uh, if it's a hybridoma, we can sequence that, uh, that antibody through uh, NGS sequencing. Uh, but I, I truly believe that getting th these uh, sequences uh, is, is really important and we don't want to lose uh, these, uh, these critical reagents uh, for uh, diagnostic and, and, uh, and therapeutic use. So in conclusion, our custom antibody services really enable researchers to you know, protect against the loss, mutation or contamination, ensuring long-term supply. We engineer antibodies to improve utility in research, diagnostic and therapeutic applications. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the talk. Uh, I really want to, again, thank uh, the team here at Absolute, uh, I mean, at uh, the Antibody Society for hosting us. I want to thank all the team uh, in the UK uh, for uh, producing all this material and the great work that they do for our clients and customers. And I want to thank the audience for attending. And I'm happy to take as many questions as I can. And if I can't answer it, I guarantee you I know someone that can. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. We do have some questions. So I will start with the ones that are specific to the presentation. We have a few that are more general that I'll come back to. First question, when the final monomer percentage is reported, how many purification steps were performed? Yeah, so those are all single purifications. They're single SEC purifications. Depending on the purity required, we can do ion exchange, we can do affinity purifications, we can do all kinds of different uh, purifications. So really that's in conversation uh, when you actually determine what uh, material you're looking for, uh, is it determines how much purification we do on that material. But all this material was actually produced in a single, uh, so that that monomer percentage was all done in a single SEC row. Next question. Does the SCFV location in your two by two design affect PK? I'm sorry, what was the last, but does it affect? PK, the uh, pharmacokinetics, PK. Oh, I'm sure it does. I'm not an expert in that, in that regard. Um, uh, I, I think um, the, uh, the, the, the stereochemistry of these actually have a major impact on their uh, efficacy. So I would have to rely on that data that we're looking for, uh, you know, from Sanquin, uh, and, and I, we should have answers to that specifically uh, with that data. Next question. What strategies do you use to improve yields? Yeah. So there's a couple of things we can do. Um, one is we look at the sequence and make sure there's no sort of, uh, uh, sort of, uh, like um, unpaired cysteines uh, can cause problems with uh, dimerization outside the one you want. Uh, we look at um, uh, another feature that we're, we're exploring, which has actually had some very good uh, results is codon optimization. Uh, so we just uh, change the DNA sequence, same antibody, uh, amino acid sequence, 
can have a drastic effect on the uh, the translation. Uh, so we uh, we have those two things at our disposal, um, and and honestly, and we do we can tweak uh, the actual production in our uh, our HEC format. Uh, we can use Cho cells uh, if if that might be better. Um, so there's quite a few things we can do. And again, as I say, sometimes the biology dictates how much yield there is, but we can do quite a few things uh, to improve yield. But uh, right now we're seeing actually some really good results with the codon optimization, as I said, that allows us to do um, to get higher yields. It's not always guaranteed, uh, but uh, that's uh, that's those are the two things we can do. And I've had quite a bit of history in in uh, biopharmaceutical working with with Amgen, Genentech and others. Uh, there's so many things you can do in the environment with the cells uh, that can be optimized uh, in terms of you know CO2 and temperature and pressure and salt content and pH and there's all kinds of different things that can be done. I think uh, you know if you look at a pharma a biopharma uh, you know when they're producing kilograms of material uh, they produce you know grams per liter of material uh, but that optimization, uh, it takes years, uh, so it kind of depends on what you're actually trying to do. We usually make, you know, milligrams of material for research use, uh, but we do our best to give you the best yield possible. Very good. And thorough answer. <laughs> Next question. Which chromatography method did you use to separate homo versus heterodimers in XMAB? So all of these uh, are just uh, SEC runs. Um, the assumption is that the knot and hole would actually, uh, remove, uh, the homo dimers. Um, but they also, most of the homo dimers have a different molecular weight than the hetero dimers. Um, so it can be tricky if, if they're the same exact molecular weight, uh, then we use an ion exchange column or an affinity column, uh, to actually pull those, pull those out. Uh, and we have all those technologies. Again, we use whatever, uh, uh, you know, chromatography we need to make sure we get the purest material possible. Next question. What was the system used for expressing the parental monoclonals and bispecifics? Yeah, so Cho we cells? use uh, HEC, HEC cells, right? HEK cells. Um, we can use CHO uh, if, if, that's, uh, if that optimizes yield, but our HEC system is the one we use first. Uh, it's been, it's very robust. We have a very, uh, you know, uh, we have so much uh, experience with that, that platform uh, and we use uh, our hex cells uh, for most of our expressions. What impact did transfection ratios have on the yields? Good question. I don't have the answer to that. I can find out uh, what that is. I don't know what the, uh, what the, ratio of plasmid we used in each of these uh, materials. So I can find that out. That's a great, great question. Does your FC null construct bind to protein A slash G with the same affinity as FC? Good question. Um, it does bind. I do not know the relative ratio of sort of uh, at like the LALA mutation or the FC null mutation, how bind, how how tightly those bind. So I can also find that information out. I, if I have it, I don't know if we actually measure <laughs> the binding affinity to the IG, uh, the the uh, the see the protein column. So let me let me well, I can dig that up if I if I have it. If I don't, I'll uh, I'll let everyone know. Next question, if you're ready. I'm going to make some notes here. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get too far ahead. Of I, know, I know you have these written down, but I just want to make sure I, I capture them. <laughs> Next question. Have you done any additional engineering for knobs into holes based design to decrease homodimer ratios? Yeah, so the team, I believe these knob and holes were the conventional knob and holes. I think they were published in gosh, 20 years ago, something like that. Um, but uh, we can do uh, some uh, some knob and hole engineering. Uh, I know that has been done. The other thing that's really important is when we do engineering for your 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 you know your project, 
uh, you own all of that material and, and the sequences. So whatever we engineer, uh, it becomes sort of a, a collaborative effort and, and we, we discuss those confidentially between us and we create that molecule for you. Um, and gosh, if it's something that works really well, I'd love to publish it. Uh, we, we would love to publish material, uh, but these materials here were all done with the conventional knob and hole uh, technology. Next question. Can you comment on the relationship between bispecific format and antibody pharmacokinetics relative to a monoclonal antibody? Hmm. That's a probably a longer, that's a, probably another seminar, um, <laughs> to be honest. I, I don't, I don't really know uh, off the top of my head, the pharmacokinetics of, of the two different ones. I know the bispecifics are, are being used to really, uh, you know, uh, facilitate a better clinical outcome. Uh, and that clinical outcome is what's driving the bispecific use. Uh, so the individual pharmacokinetics, I, I don't know. Next question is multi-part. So I will ask you to hold on while I ask all three parts <laughs> and then you can dive right in. Have you added a VHH to an IgG? And where would you attach it in C terminal? How would you design the linker? Ooh, let's see, VHH. Um, I'll probably have to get back to you on that question because I don't know. I, given we have 200 formats, um, I, I would say probably we've made one of those. Um, but in terms of where we connected it and, and what, what linkers we used, I'd have to get back to you. So I'm happy to, to go look. And for the benefit of the audience, the platform does record the questions. It does record who asked the questions. Uh, so uh, Ed will actually get back to you. I promise. <laughs> we, will, we will make sure your questions are answered. Next question. What is the difference between pardon my pronunciation if I've got this wrong, CXMAB and LY formats. So across MAB, if you look at the format there on the top, uh, I guess the, I, I know it's very small to see, but we have two FC regions, uh, two different FC regions, one from the, one from the uh, OKT3 and one from the HER2, uh, and that's uh, mirrored on the, on the BAV12. It's functionally you can see that it's gray. I think you can see that gray. It's just dependent on which uh, FC, which part of the FC we use from the different um, from the different antibodies. Okay. Next question. You're doing very well. <laughs> and we've got questions. lots of questions. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, thanks so much to the audience for this very active participation. Next question. Just wondering if any of the formats have a tendency to be more immunogenic or rather the immunogenicity is more likely related to the CDR targeting domains that are cloned into these novel formats. Yeah, I think, I think that question goes back to that same idea of, of uh, you know, the targets and the affinity for those targets, uh, whether we're immunogenic or not. Um, I can't say really, you know, I think some of these formats are, are, you know, all of these formats are being used in clinical trials. Uh, so you would assume that, you know, the people that know pharmacokinetics are, are keenly interested in how these are actually, uh, uh, the, the, the fact that they're being used in the clinic suggests that they are, uh, uh, you know, are, are uh, well, well established for their targets. But we haven't done any pharmacokinetic data. I mean, functionally, we provide the material and, uh, you know, you tell us if it works and if it doesn't, we engineer it to hopefully get you the answers you need. Next question. Does the format impact solubility? We haven't seen that, to my knowledge. Uh, so you do see aggregation, but aggregation is typically associated with unpaired cysteines, right? So we get aggregation through uh, you know, uh, dimerization or, or uh, 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 impact through cysteines. 
Uh, these formats are very stable. We do see sometimes a pH sensitivity for, uh, for, uh, for antibodies, so they will precipitate at a, at a given pH uh, if they're close to their PI point. Uh, so we do work with people if they find one that tends to aggregate. If it's not free cysteines, it's you know, oftentimes a pH dependent uh, component. Um, but uh, none of these formats, to my knowledge, had any issues with um, with uh, precipitation. Easy question, I hope, here. Will this study be published once functional characterization comparisons are completed? Absolutely, that's the idea. Our team, uh, we're like I said, there's a lot of formats, a lot of different data sets. So yes, we, we do plan on publishing this with our team at, at Sanquin. Can you comment about TM for these 17 bispecific molecules? Great question. I do not have that data. Uh, I would love to have that data, but I do not. Uh, I don't believe we've done any uh, any of that, uh, any of those measurements. In the non-reduced setting, SDS, such as mm -hmm. for the cross mob structure, why did you see multiple bands? Yeah. So this these are uh, this is denaturing SDS. So the multiple bands are multiple formats or fragments. So these are fragments that didn't actually uh, bind. So you can see uh, probably light chain and heavy chain there, uh, like in this BAB8 format. So you can see that we don't see, uh, you know, the, the material we, we pull out is, is the largest molecular weight. How do you avoid assembly or homodimer issues, if any, in multiple formats? Yeah, I mean, that's the technology, right? The, the first, the light chain and heavy chain, if they're in one sequence are designed, you know, they're transcribed in one, one, uh, one, uh, uh, one chain. The, uh, the, the assembly of a typical antibody is, is heavy chain, light chain interaction with cysteines. The, uh, if they're heterodimers, then you have to use the knob and hold technology. That knob and hold technology ensures that you get preferential binding uh, with uh, its heterodimer partner. Now, it doesn't exclude the fact that they can uh, bind, uh, you know, as homodimers, but the majority uh, of them will bind as heterodimers. I think it's, uh, you know, it's a well-proven technology, the knob and hole, and it, it does produce a, a high percentage of, of heterodimers. Next question. Are there any IP restrictions for the SCFE FC formats? So this is a great question because we don't, uh, we do our best to be agnostic. Uh, we don't, you know, functionally, we don't want to know what the material is. Uh, you tell us what sequence you want to run, we'll do our best to produce it. Uh, we do, uh, uh, so the IP question functionally be belongs to whoever requests the material uh, because it's, you're the one actually using that material. Um, if it's a published sequence, of course we can we can we can uh, we can share that. But we don't share our sequences or your sequences with anyone. Uh, those sequences are yours, and they're confidentially held uh, for your for your work. So uh, you know it, it's it's really important that uh, you know if you tell us what the target is, we'll know. But we don't share that with anyone. If you choose not to tell us the target, that's completely up to you as well. Uh, we we are functionally we're we're antibody engineers. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, what you actually do with that material is uh, sort of uh, functionally up to you. Next question. Other than SEC, what other analysis should be done to analyze these samples, especially for early developability assessment? Yeah. Um, so there's a ton of different techniques to characterize antibodies. I spent most of my career uh, using uh, or, or helping people with those technologies. Um, it kind of depends on what you are looking for. Of course, there's uh, one, of the, one of the techniques that I used uh, for almost a, two decades is capillary electrophoresis. Uh, you can do isoelectric point analysis. You can do carbohydrate analysis. Uh, you can do ion exchange. Uh, there's, uh, you know, you can do calorimetry, you can, there's, there's, there's a, you can do mass spectrometry, of course. Uh, we actually do uh, have uh, a mass spectrometry uh, capability. So if you want these materials sequenced, uh, de novo sequenced after the production, 
to make sure we produce the material that you that you're looking for we can actually do that uh, so mass spectrometry is a very powerful technique i think that's the one we typically go to for additional characterization of the material uh, but as far as purity and separation we use mostly ion exchange affinity and as all these slides have uh, sec can you comment on possible applications of bispecific antibodies in immunoassays or diagnostics? So we're just now seeing the interest in diagnostics. Uh, what we're finding uh, or what, what I've found in my research is that people are really looking for as much multiplexing as possible. Uh, so the ability to do multiple targets uh, in a single assay uh, and these bispecifics would lend themselves to that, uh, to do uh, multiple targets with a single uh, antibody uh, in a uh, IHC assay or, or flow cytometry assay, something like that. Uh, so that's where uh, we're seeing uh, interest in uh, sort of uh, the IHC diagnostic space. Um, diagnostics love multiplexing because it cuts down costs and it improves uh, sort of the readout, what, what information you get at the end. Back to a technical question. Again, a multi-part part one. Oh, please <laughs> I'm not hold doing very well on a multi-part one, but I'll keep trying. <laughs> Have you tried different orientations for SCFEs? Next part of the question, via linker VH or VH linker VL? And have you seen differences in stability or expression yield? So another good question. I think we have used our linkers that we typically use. So we have a sort of uh, a common linker that we use for uh, our bispecifics and our technology. I'd have to look to see if we've used different linkers to improve yields. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. So I'd have to go back to to the team to understand linkers uh, and yields. I, I, don't, I don't have the answer to that. That's two Another, questions on linkers that I do not know. So I will, <laughs> I will brush up on my linker uh, information. Yes, again, to the, to the audience here, the questions are recorded. Uh, I will endeavor to impose on Dr. Horton later to write brief answers to the questions so they can be made available to to everybody um, and we'll see if he is amenable to that I'll, I'll, I'll do make the <laughs> uh, next question uh, let's see uh, that was is the okt3 affinity modified would the bivalent cd3 arm toxicity compare to monovalence i think i got that right um I think the data says yes, um, but again, that's where we're really waiting for that cell-based assays to tell us uh, what the affinity is, whether the, these things are actually, you know, uh, causing these these cells to to die, or basically to to to, you know, we, we, we can get functionally binding assays with these. So I think that's uh, something we're interested in seeing. I, I don't know the answer to that, but uh, we, we will have the answer to that as soon as we pull the cell uh, cell-based data. And a question about a specific design and whether it is viable. The design is the C-terminal SCFE fusion to light chain kappa or lambda of IgG1. Yeah, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to read that one. And, and, <laughs> and <laughs> I appreciate that question, though. I have to. I have to. I have to think about that one. That's that. That's a good question, but I'll have to think about that. I don't have an answer for you right away. And another question uh, about when to use IgG1, IgG1 null, or IgG4 isotypes in a bispecific design. Yeah, that's just completely dependent on what sort of your end goal is. Um, you know, IgG1 and IgG2 are the functionally the easier to, to make. We've made most of those, but uh, you know, IgG4, it's all the, you know, they're, they're, how they, how they're constructed. Um, it's really, that becomes a conversation, honestly. Um, the, the team has a great, you know, sort of, uh, background in which molecules, uh, 
the production of those molecules and what might work best. Um, it really depends on what you're trying to do. So I, I think it's important, again, that when you want to make a molecule, we talk to you about the application, what you're trying to do, what the results you're looking for, and then we can uh, engineer the best uh, molecule for you. We, we can make all those formats. It's just dependent on what your end goal is. Next question. What molecular cloning techniques did you use to make all the formats? Uh, Gibson, Hi-Fi assembly, or anything else that you found to be more efficient in constructing them? I will have to get back to you on that. I think there is some proprietary components to the way we make our uh, make our, our material. It's all plasmid based. Uh, we do uh, make our, our plasmids in house. Um, uh, we you know we 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 we, we, uh, we transcribe our our plasmids um, and then we in, you know transfect into the hex cells. Um, I'll have to get back to you on on that uh, and how many plasmids we use. And what I think another question we had was what ratio we put them into the, uh, into the cells. That, those are questions I don't, I, don't, I don't have the answer to. And some of that might be proprietary, but I'll get you the answer the, the, as much as I can. Next question. Is there a reason that this study did not include the dual variable domain also called DVD format? Yeah, I think what we tried to do is really just took the formats that are in the clinical trials. We we did not, uh, you know, we could make all the material that's, you know, makeable, uh, but we really did tailor this study based on what's what's uh, what's what's in clinical trials. That's a fair answer. Mm -hmm. There are an awful lot there's, of formats. Yeah, I, as I said, there's, there's over 200. So we're, we're happy to try to make something uh, for you. But uh, for this particular study, honestly, 17 was a, honestly, I, I think this was a, a, a ambitious project to begin with. Uh, we did this all obviously for, uh, of our own accord uh, and, and for our own study of our own information and, and 17 transfections uh, of by specifics uh, is quite, quite, quite a large project. Next question. What about signal peptides used for the individual chains? Did you optimize them or are you using a one fits all approach? I think we're one fits all, but I'll have to ask uh, to see if we if we actually used um, uh, different signal peptides. I, I don't think we did. I think we're using the same one for all of these. I think we use this. I think we use the same signal peptide for almost all of our work, but I can I can ask. Next question. Could you comment on the developability parameters for a bispecific antibody? How does the placement of the fragment affect the same, the same, not yeah, sure the like same that. what, but. <laughs> the same material. Um, I, I think, you know, we didn't do any uh, excessive, well, we didn't do really any engineering on these materials other than formatting. So we put these materials just basically creating them. Uh, so. You know, when we look at something like this knob and hole, this BA5, where we had, you know, 14 megs per liter, you know, we would definitely consider maybe taking a look at, at, at re, you know, you know, codon optimization or some other type of, of, of optimization to improve yields. I think the worst yield was, uh, what's this one? This, this is the cross mad material. Um, we definitely, you know, want to take a look at that sequence and see if we could optimize the, uh, the expression. Next question. Can you comment about how the variable domain affects stability of bispecific antibodies? I cannot. So we, we did all of these, all of these bispecifics were quite stable. We don't have, we had, didn't have any issue with them, uh, you know, uh, and it doesn't look like, you know, we transport these to the for their, for their functional assays. We don't, I don't think we've seen any degradation over time of these materials. Uh, but that's relatively new. So I, I don't have an answer. Uh, you know, the formulation on these is important. Um, I think we put these all in the same buffer system. So, uh, you know, if there was degradation, then you would look at the formulation. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, pH is a, is a critical, uh, you know, component of that formulation, but I don't see any, um, uh, I don't believe we had any issues with these, these formats. And somebody picks up on your comment. 
what types of functional assays are you prioritizing with Sanguin? So uh, the assays I believe are uh, are CD4 positive cells, CD8 positive cells. You can see the data. I know it's just it's very small there. Um, so we're looking at uh, program cell death or and and the, you know functionally the cell death of those cells uh, when they bind. Um, these antibodies. So I don't have any more data, but uh, what's shown, but hopefully we'll have that data soon. And the last question, unless somebody else comes up with another one, the last one had to do, oops, somebody did come up with another one. <laughs> oh, you are so fast. Uh, the um, the quick one, you, you might have already really kind of addressed this as best you can. The question is about um, how immunogenicity of bispecific antibodies in general. Yeah, I mean, I really couldn't speak to that too much. I mean, I think, again, the, the way we chose this study and the chose the 17 formats were all clinical trials. So the folks that are studying these materials and uh, inherently, you know, tied to their functionality uh, have said that they're, you know, going to work. Uh, otherwise, all the millions and millions of dollars being spent on their, you know, on their uh, uh, their clinical use uh, probably wouldn't wouldn't go very far. So uh, I'd have to you know rely you know the teams that are doing those in, in the pharma industry would know best. I, I don't. And and honestly that you know we will we're antibody experts. We will produce the material you ask us to produce. We will optimize the material that you ask us to produce. The science in terms of what these antibodies do and what they do in your system is you know up to the science and the biology that you're trying to work with another couple of quick questions here the structure of bispecific antibody 12 is there a cross mab vl ch1 following both scfes i believe so but i'll have to get back to the, on the exact sequences there Okay, and what I think will be the final question, somebody is asking you to pick your favorite child. My favorite child? <laughs> which, oh, which, <laughs> which of the bispecific antibody formats has impressed you the most? Well, I, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, a visual component to these things. You know, you, we've all probably seen the 3D structures of, 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 uh, IgGs and immun immunoglobulins over time. Uh, I think I, I just love the classic format because it it's you know I can I can see the 3D structure uh, you know in my head uh, rotating around. So I'd, I'd have to go with the classic uh, uh, number one there. All the other ones are sort of you know if they work fine, but I like the first one. <laughs> okay. And we and I keep telling you this is the last question, but now we have another last question. Uh, in the bispecific antibody case, there is one particular chain acting by limiting the expression of the others, and if so, which one does that? Hmm. I don't know if I understand that question exactly. Um, does it limit the expression? Is that what the question? Sorry. I think so. Yes, I think it, it, there's one particular there's one chain, chain of the expression of the other. I don't think so. That's a great question, though. I don't know. Um, I would assume that they're made relatively equally, but that kind of goes back to that question about plasmids, right? When we think about did we add the same one one to one ratio of plasmids uh, depending on their uh, efficiency of transcription? I, I think so, but I'm not not sure. So we'd have to I'd have to ask, and that's that's now I think the third sort of variant on this a similar question on you know whether we actually add different ratios of plasmid to improve the number of heterodimers we get uh, in the system. I'll have to ask that question. I don't know. Okay, and yet another last question. <laughs> like the sixth yeah. last question. <laughs> Uh, do the bispecific antibody one, did you have any expression low yield issues? Uh, no, I think that's the one that actually, uh, so it expressed at 80 mix per liter. Uh, I think, you know, anything above 50 is considered, I think, pretty good. Um, 
And again, we didn't do any massive optimization of these uh, to, to improve the expression yields. Um, but uh, I think I would say that that's pretty good uh, at 80 mix per liter. Excellent. Okay, audience, going, going, gone. Last chance. Nobody I picks do, me up on it. That I, really was the last question. I do really so. want to thank everybody and their attendance. <laughs> Questions are great. Um, again, I'm happy to try to help. Uh, the team uh, is, is, is I, I can't say how passionate they are about this topic. Um, they uh, truly believe that, uh, you know, we're, we're making antibodies for the greater good. Uh, I believe that, and I think this organization is uh, is ready to help uh, you do what you need to do. Thank you very much. In concluding, I'd like to thank Dr. Horton for providing insights on the feasibility of various bispecific antibody formats. And I thank you, audience members, for joining the webinar and for your very active participation. An on-demand version will be available in about a day. I'll send a link to it by email to everyone who registered. Please do feel free to watch this or any of our on-demand webinars when it's convenient. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone.